Effective Textbook Study Techniques Part 1 How to Outline a Textbook Chapter by David Richardson What is knowledge? Here's a dictionary definition. Knowledge is a noun. It refers to facts, information, and skills acquired by a person through experience or education, the theoretical or practical understanding of a subject. It's also awareness or familiarity gained by experience of fact or a situation. Everyone recognizes how valuable knowledge is. We pay serious money to get knowledge that we don't have but need, such as medical diagnoses or security systems for our computers, to those who have that knowledge for sale, like doctors and computer programming specialists. And so, though each of us really knows that getting knowledge is of value to us, the problem is many of us have never been taught how to do it. We simply don't have the tools. We've been frustrated in school, didn't make really good grades, and found the book assignments just too dense to hack through. We know how valuable knowledge is, sort of, but we can't get a practical sense of it for ourselves, at least enough of a practical grasp of what knowledge could mean to our lives to motivate us to try again to penetrate that pile of manuals and books in the corner that we should have mastered but have never gotten to. I can't do the motivation thing for you in a slide, but I can give you a bit of hope. And hope changes everything. The reason? It changes you. The fact is, you can learn to study like a pro. That's a skill like driving a forklift or operating a cash register. It can be learned, but you need to first believe that this is possible. That's what hope is for. And you must also believe that acquiring this skill will improve your life. Otherwise, why should you bother? So, if I've gotten you to hope, then we now need a more complete and practical understanding of what knowledge is by discovering what it actually does for us, or makes possible to us. And it's here that the answer to the question, why should I bother, can be found. For example, knowledge can give you keys to innovation, keys that change for the better your life and the lives of others. It can also help you to achieve your goals against opposition, even strong opposition, by giving you tools to do things smarter, faster, and better. Knowledge can make business plans successful and earn really good money. It can equip you to solve problems as well as to climb the ladder of success in your chosen career. Knowledge is even the foundation for informed social and political action that builds better communities. To put this another way, knowledge empowers us to put ourselves, our world, our relationships, and our communities together. That's why when we don't have the knowledge that we need, things fall apart. So if you want your life to work, you need techniques for getting knowledge. Now how's that for motivation? We either learn how to learn, or our lives, careers, relationships, and communities simply fall apart. So, if you are motivated, let's ask the real question, and it's this. How do we get knowledge that exists outside our heads into our heads? So it can be used practically and effectively. In other words, how do we become good at mastering the information provided in textbooks and manuals in order to function effectively in any given field, whether academic or practical, whether that's qualifying to operate a forklift or to serve as a CNA, or learning the protocols and procedures for qualifying as a laboratory research technician or a product testing specialist. Of course, one can learn skills hands-on. That's always been a tradition for passing down skills generation to generation, so this can be effective. But in a highly technical and fast-paced world, this has become impractical. Even skilled trades these days, such as carpentry and plumbing, require some academic preparation. Virtually everything these days has a certification test. Professional truck driving, for example, has a basket full of manuals and a matching set of tests that the prospective truck driver must pass in order to work in the industry. 
So most of our formal training, whether in school or in training for a job, comes from textbooks and manuals, either on actual paper, fastened with staples or held together in a binding, like a traditional book, or presented on electronic screens using a computer or e-reader. But either way, the manual or textbook will present pages with information, information that the student must read, organize, and master in order to earn credits leading to a degree in a field of study or to earn official certification in a career skill. So what does all this mean practically to us? Simple. Knowing how to study textbooks and manuals to get required knowledge into our heads for practical use for both work and our personal lives will actually make the difference between day and night, between a calm and controlled improvement in skills and problem-solving ability and sheer frustration and panic. But there is good news. The basic techniques for mastering manuals and textbooks are not difficult. They take a bit of time, but getting knowledge into one's head is valuable and merits the time required to do it. So let's learn the most important tool for getting the knowledge job done. It's this. Textbooks and manuals are not like other books. They are not written in the same way. How are they different? I have found a contemporary historian's account online of America's progressive era, written by history professor Dr. James Ross Nazell. This period of our national history begins shortly after the Civil War, 1865, and the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, 1869. The date given for the start of this period is generally 1881, and the Civil War and railroads play a central role in how this period unfolds. The Progressive Era continues into the 20th century and includes well-known historical figures such as Teddy Roosevelt and recognizable companies such as Standard Oil. The period concludes, according to historians, at the end of President Woodrow Wilson's administration, which was December 1921, just slightly over three years after the First World War ended, November 11th, 1918, and just at the time the Roaring Twenties was getting started. Now why is any of this important? A couple of reasons. First of all, I have run into few typical students who are wildly interested in the progressive era. I must say, as a teacher, that's too bad. It's an important period of America's story that echoes into the present. But I'm simply reporting what I've observed. Reading a 40 to 50 page chapter on the progressive era is not what most students would like to do. But that's useful for me, because the more a student doesn't want to learn about a topic, the more that student needs to know the technique I'm about to teach. To put this another way, not interested in the progressive era? That's too bad. Your assignment is the 47-page chapter in the textbook. It's Wednesday. The teacher wants an outline of the chapter on his desk by tomorrow morning. And the quiz is Friday. 50% of your grade will be based on your quiz scores throughout the semester. Do you want to get the same miserable grade on this quiz that you got on the first three quizzes? If not, I have a technique that can help you, that can help you ace this quiz and do equally as well on the quizzes to come. In addition, you'll get that outline in on time. It will take less than 30 minutes to do. Interested? And here is the second reason. I have found this chapter in two formats. The one displayed here is the format typical of a book. Take a good look. The one that's coming up for display is the format typical of a textbook. It's different. Get ready to tell how it is different. Are you ready? And here it is. Can you tell the difference? It is exactly the same portion of writing we saw in the previous slide, but it is markedly different. This is textbook style. What is textbook style? Simply this. In a textbook, the chapter outline is embedded in the pages of the chapter as you read it. How can you keep the organization straight? Simple. The size and style of print is the key to putting the outline together in the proper order. Major parallel points are written in the same style and size of print. 
Subpoints listed under the appropriate major points are written in smaller print and usually in a different style. A student can pull the outline right out of the chapter without reading that chapter just by following the major chapter divisions, major points under each division, and subpoints under each of these divisions. In fact, getting the outline out of the chapter before reading it is essential to studying the chapter and mastering its details, content, and organization. Don't see it yet? Then let's add some color. The colors that match here I have used to identify divisions and subdivisions of this chapter that are parallel to one another. The outline's title will simply be the chapter title. That's in orange, the Progressive Era Part 1. Then we encounter the first major division of the chapter. That's in dark red, Origins of the Progressive Movement. This major chapter division is also divided into four subpoints shown here in blue. Migration, life in the newly settled areas, religious and moral concerns, and the turning point. And please note that the author has emphasized certain terms and words. These are in green, but they are not subpoints. Rather, they are terms the author wants you to be able to define when you are finished studying. So make a list. But note, the turning point. That subdivision has additional divisions of its own. Two of them are showing here, noted in lilac. But there are two more subdivisions under this heading. So let's take a closer look. Here is the turning point with all four of its subpoints showing. Here is how the outline would look. D, the turning point, and then subpoints under D that explain what this turning point means. Subpoint 1, from moral to modern progressivism. Subpoint 2, the need for historical understanding. Subpoint 3, pre-Civil War antecedents to progressivism. And subpoint 4, Darwin's influence. Why is this important? Here is why. These four points, along with the additional terms to define, describe fully what Dr. Ross Nazel means by the turning point heading. In other words, should Dr. Nazel give a quiz that asks for a brief essay on the meaning of the turning point, the student's answer would have to address all four of these points, including the terms to define, at the very least, in order to earn full credit and having the outline makes this clear. But the author is not done. In the subsection under the turning point entitled Darwin's Influence, Dr. Nazelle has even more to say, enough to justify dividing up this section about Darwin into three finer sections. One, white man's burden. Two, the United States as the model. And three, the depiction of social Darwinism. With these divisions, the author adds four special vocabulary terms. Social Darwinism, the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair, William McGee, and the Igorot Village. These three points, along with the vocabulary terms, more fully explain what Dr. Ross Nazel means by Darwin's influence. Let's look at this whole section on Darwin to see how he does it. Again, these three points, along with the vocabulary terms, explain what the author means by Darwin's influence. Division 1, White Man's Burden, treats how Darwin's scientific ideas about biological variation and development, natural selection, and the survival of the fittest, were used philosophically and politically to support the view that Western culture is superior over other world cultures. Division 2, the United States as the model, narrows the field of superiority, identifying the United States as the very top of the superior cultural development, the naturally selected fittest nation, so to speak. Division 3, the depiction of social evolution, then illustrates the two previous points by describing the walkthrough exhibition at the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair that employed real native peoples to play roles that portrayed the march of progress from inferior, barbaric, and less technically advanced cultures, the Igorot village, to the very top of modern civilization, represented by displays of American pride, such as freshly painted naval warships. 
we are now uncovering before your eyes the complete outline of this entire section origins of the progressive movement you will see it all but then we will construct this outline from the text using only the headings subheadings and sub subheadings on the left we will see the outline on the right we will view the actual text you will be able to see how we can quickly pull the outline right from the headings and subheadings embedded in the text without having to read the text itself. Note how the chapter title in orange on the right, Progressive Era Part 1, becomes the outline's title. Then see how the first major chapter section in dark red on the right, Origins of the Progressive Movement, becomes the first major division in the outline. This major division is broken up into equal points in blue on the right. Each of these is placed as an equally important point on the left in the outline. A. Migration B. Life in the newly settled areas C. Religious and moral concerns and D. The turning point Now let's focus on the turning point. This subdivision is divided up into four subsections. The first two of these subsections are in lilac on the right. One, moral to modern progressivism, and two, the need for historical understanding. The author adds two more points of equal weight under the turning point. These are in lilac on the right. In the outline, these become three, the pre-Civil War antecedents to progressivism, and four, Darwin's influence. Now look how the subsection, Darwin's influence, is treated. This subsection has three parallel subdivisions of its own, each explaining a way in which Darwin's ideas affected progressive thinking about social change. The white man's burden, the United States as the model, and the depiction of social evolution. And here is the finished outline. It simply jumps off the page, waiting for the insightful student to catch it. But what about the next chapter section? Follow simply the same procedure to pull out the outline for that section of the chapter as well. Let's look at Professor Ross Nazel's next major chapter division. It is, what did it mean to be a progressive? And please don't be surprised to discover that the method used to divide this section is exactly the same as the one we have been using. Again, simply follow the procedure you have been shown, and the outline will come out just as easily. The next major chapter section in this textbook piece by Professor Ross Nozell is What Did It Mean to Be a Progressive? Let's take a quick look. Look at the top left of the page. See the style of print for the chapter section, What Did It Mean to Be a Progressive? Notice the large print, all in capital letters, and its size confirms that it is the dominant point. And this second major chapter section, just like the first, is subdivided into supporting points. The first division we can see is common traits. See how this print is smaller and in a different type style from the chapter division above it? First, it's not in all capital letters, and the print is smaller, but this heading too is broken up into supporting subdivisions of its own. The two showing on this page are religious evangelicalism and academic training in the social sciences and business. Notice how these last two headings under common traits are written in the same size and style to one another, but each is smaller and in a different style from common traits. For example, each is underlined. They are parallel points expressed physically in a common style to emphasize their relationship and equality. The writer is using these equal points to identify common traits among progressives, and the outline reflects this. See how it looks? It follows exactly the same method we have been using. The outline literally falls off the page for us to catch. I'm sure that you've noticed that we have been talking about traditional outlines, you know, the ones that use Roman numerals, right? Some people find this outlining technique a little confusing and have trouble with it, so they avoid it. 
Now let me be clear, outlining technique is a useful academic and learning skill. You should acquire it. You will run into outlines everywhere, from tables of contents for books and manuals, to business or commercial reports and summaries, to even meeting agendas. You won't find an escape from them, but don't be intimidated. Instead, promise yourself to learn outlining technique. You will master it and it won't take that long. But don't despair for what we are doing. You don't need to master outlining technique before using the study methods that I have shown you. In fact, you won't even have to touch a Roman numeral. Here's why. Look above. Here is how traditional outlining works, like the one we have been working with. You know, Roman numerals for the major chapter divisions, like the Roman numeral 1 here, followed by capital letters to denote the major supporting points in each chapter division, like this. But each supporting point for a major chapter division may have subpoints of its own to provide additional organization and structure, and these are indicated by numbers, like this. Finally, even one of these subpoints may be more finely divided, again providing additional organization. These are indicated by small case letters, like this. There are a few other things to know about outlines, but that's the short course introduction. How hard was that? Yet, if you still don't like outlining, or if you find it confusing with Roman numerals and all that, then don't use outlining at all for studying. How? Simple. Instead of outlining, just indent. Write the title of the outline centered at the top. Remember, just use the chapter title. Then begin placing the major chapter divisions on the left margin, as shown here. The supporting points under a major chapter division you then indent directly below and farther to the right, showing that these are parallel points in support of this chapter division, making sure to keep each point even with one another, like this. If one of these supporting points has subdivisions of its own, then indent each of these directly below and farther to the right, like this. See how it works? If one of these supporting points is more finely divided still, indent directly below again and farther to the right, like this. Get the idea? As I promised, you can have the outline you need for study without ever touching a Roman numeral, and that should work just fine. The points that go together are identified by their position from the left margin. Parallel points are even with one another from the margin. Subordinate points that go under a broader division are set below that division and indented farther to the right, and so forth. The result will prove just as useful as a regular outline for study purposes. Now let me remind you, I told you that getting the outline is the first step in actually studying the chapter. We have simply been reading these headings of visions, that's all. We haven't touched the actual chapter text. So what's the next step? The next step is learning how to study, and that's the subject of the second presentation in this series. I can't give away all the secrets, but I will give you a couple of hints. First, learn the difference between reading and studying. Studying occurs when a student reads a chapter in order to find the answers to a set of central questions about the text questions that unlock the chapter organization and fits important details into that organizational structure so that the student can remember them and relate them correctly to one another. When a student fails to do this, the student simply fails to study and simply reads. But just reading alone won't prepare most people for quizzes and examinations. But how do we get the central questions that help us organize and relate? I am going to show you a way for doing this in the next presentation. I can only give you a hint right now. And here's your hint. Finding your study questions requires you to take the outline that you have pulled from a textbook chapter using our techniques, and then to combine that outline with the Journalistic 6. Journalistic 6, you ask? What's that? The journalistic six you have probably heard before. Here they are. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. They are called the journalistic six because we expect professional news reporters to answer these six questions in any news stories they publish about an event. 
Who was involved? What happened? When did it happen? Where did it happen? Why did it happen? And how did it happen? But these questions can be useful for purposes other than reporting the news. But that's all I'm going to give you right now. Until next time, this is David Richardson saying, learning how to learn is an investment that you make in yourself, an investment that pays dividends for the rest of your life. So, show some faith in yourself and make that investment. It will always pay off.